Well, John is here doing the taping as per usual. We have a lovely audience of friends in Jerry and Cynthia and Joe. And today we're having a conversation with Haley Wood, who is the, what's your official title? Senior Services Director for the Town of Hadley. Excellent. And we will be talking about both Haley and about her experience here, her future here, goals for this. And as the case may be, we will loop in if you have questions or input that you would like to give. Haley, welcome to your own space. <laughs> Thanks, Sharon. <laughs> That's not too bold of me. Um, I wanted to start today with a little background on you. And my first question is, where'd you grow up? I grew up in Keene, New Hampshire. Oh, did you? Not very far away. I did not realize that you were an over-the-border girl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they let me in. <laughs> How long were you there in Keene before you? I lived in Keene until I was 18 and went to college. Yeah. Um, I went to Marlboro College in Marlboro, Vermont, and also UNH for graduate work. Um, so I was, I've been pretty New England-based my yeah. whole life. And what were your degrees in, in those two places? Literature. Ah. Perfect background for your job, wasn't it? Well, oh. you might be surprised. I ah. feel like literature is a wonderful teacher of empathy yeah. and gives a lot of information about the human condition, history, um, other, perspec other perspectives. So I do think it's come in handy, believe it or not. I actually do. Um, <laughs> I know you're a reader, so you understand. <laughs> well, I think whatever our life experiences, they coalesce into who we become. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a lovely thing. When you were 18 and chose literature, how did you see your life ahead of you? What did you think? <laughs> I have to be honest. I wasn't thinking at all about a career choice. I, I was very fortunate in a way to be impractical and led only by my desires in my heart. And I simply wanted to read books and talk about them with others and make art. I also um, did a lot of studio art in my uh, college background. And I really just wanted to do things that I wanted to do. And I know that's not the popular emphasis today with <laughs> higher education. Um, and there's a lot of anxiety with young people with making choices that they don't perceive as practical. But I feel completely fortunate that I took that path. Has that method changed over the years of following your heart? <laughs> Not really for me. Um, I think I've, in terms of career and kind of meandering through different kinds of experiences and doing some things that um, I did not know existed until the opportunity arose, uh, I do think that that's been the path for me, um, you know, for, for my whole career, which has been, um, which has only in the, in the last five years really been centered on um, working with older adults. Um, and prior to that was more aligned with my education when I was a program officer at Mass Humanities, um, which is, uh, has a headquarters in Northampton and is the affiliate for the National Endowment for the Humanities. So I did have you know, several years of plugging in kind of more public scholarship into my um, daily work life. Um, but uh, having a kind of pivoting, making a change and making a decision based on um, changing desires and priorities has worked, and I've been delighted to find myself at the Senior Center. So besides your doing, working for the, and I'm not going to get the name right, sure. for how many years was that? Only uh, Almost 17 years wow. in that role. Yeah. That must have been a huge change. Yes, it was a huge change to, to, to move into human services. And what was the move? To what did you move? Um, well, I left my job at Mass Humanities um, and did sort of an interim year at Double Edge Theatre as their managing director uh, to experiment with working in the arts more directly. Um, we had a relationship because I was a contributing artist and um, I took on that role, um, but then again had a, had a bit of a, a shift in priorities and um, thought a lot about um, plugging in a little more directly to, um, to problems and to problem solving. Um, so I did, I got a start, um, I, made, I made a conscious choice to enter the field of um, working with seniors, um, and my first job, shall we say, in that capacity was an ombudsman um, with Highland Valley Elder Services, and I went to 
Linda Manor on a weekly basis and spoke with residents and got a sense of their satisfaction or lack thereof with their care and yes. brought forward problems um, that they wanted me to. Never did that without their permission. Um, from from there, I took a, jo- a real job at Highland Valley as a care advisor. So I would visit homes um, and get to know clients. I had over 100 and help them figure out the best care plan for them, Mm -hmm. ideally, and often the abstract notion of what was good was very different than reality, unfortunately. (laughs) Um, But it was incredibly, it was an indispensable year of learning in terms of understanding what older adults, particularly low income older adults are up against as they have increasing difficulty staying home and more health problems and some of whom who don't have family to support them. Uh, from there, I became an outreach worker at the East Hampton Council on Aging for um, two years and a Shine counselor uh, focusing on social services and access to health care. And two, about two years ago, I applied for the job of Senior Services Director of Hadley and was very fortunate to get that job, um, which is a job that I'm growing with and enjoying very much. You have a background in human services that is reaching out to people, the job here must be, well, at least different in terms of what's required of you as a director. Yes, thank, it, it is. It's a lot more administrative. Okay. Uh, I manage a budget. I pay bills. I order office supplies. <laughs> I do a lot of the just kind of programmatic and um, overview of, of what we do. And uh, and with COVID, I've you know needed to become a steward of public health and help create with our board policies um, for the safety of residents and define what we think is safe access to this building. I'm incredibly glad and, and proud of the fact that this senior center has been open more than any other senior center in Hampshire County. We are fortunately, we have a, it's a huge space with a brand new HVAC system. That's one of the reasons why we can do that but we thought really carefully about um, the space we have and how we could control the flow of humans and limit class participation and do you know how keep the brakes on things a little bit. Um, but it's true that, so my job here is not outreach focused and we have an outreach coordinator, that's Lauren Hannigan. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I do find, well, but just last week I had a home visit with someone for a shine appointment to try to figure out how she can spend less money on medication. Mm-hmm. So when the need arises, I, I'm happy to do that and it, it keeps me in touch in a way that matters to me. Before we leave you and your CV, um, tell us about where you are now and what your family life sure. is. Okay. I live in Northampton. I've been there in the same house with, uh, for, with my husband for 23 years. We have a 16-year-old son who attends Northampton High School. He's a junior this year, and he is a football player. That's the big focus of his life right now. And um, his name is Otis. My, my husband's name is Mark Rossler. He's a writer and a photographer. Uh, we live in a, a, a neighborhood that we really like that is very close to the center of town, but far mm-hmm. enough away to be residential and comfortable and also is very close to places where you can walk your dog without a leash, which <laughs> is a value that we uphold. You didn't mention your dog is part oh, of the family. And, Come on, And I man. should have because she's the queen of the house. <laughs> um, her, her name is Blanca. She's a, you know, an, an adorable little being. I wish she could be here today. <laughs> Was she here for the dog show? No, she's too badly behaved for that. <laughs> Anything we've touched on or haven't covered that you'd like to know about her? This I'm is glad it. you touched on the COVID. I mean, you came into this position just before that broke out. And, oh, my goodness, all of us are just, you know, been struggling through this whole thing, trying to do the right thing. And, yep. Decision and fatigue is, is... responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for mentioning that and validating that that has been hard. It has mm-hmm. been, and it, I don't think it, that it's going to continue to be hard. We might reach a point with this next surge of infections, and it is rising in Hadley, um, where we again need to close to the public um, and only offer essential services, but really limit or even eliminate access to not, you know, non-essential, shall we say, the things that um, 
the more fun things that we do, which is a lot. Um, and I really don't want to do that, but we will if we have to. So I, I do think we've got additional decision making ahead that we won't be free of for quite some time. How do you see you making those kind of choices? Because if you read a lot of sources, there is mixed um, uh, opinion about what what's critical and what's not. Um, and the most recent things I've been reading is that we are overreacting. Mm -hmm. um, so what what are your sources that you turn to? I mean, part of it's legal of the state. Um, but there are and there there is nothing in select board. I'm saying, but it might. Right. I mean, so those and it are has the things. Been. But other than that, um, what would be your resources for mm -hmm. making that decision that's within your power? <laughs> Every week I look at the COVID dashboard on the Massachusetts.gov website that shares data that was prepared by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. So I get the incidence number, you know, so the number of positive cases that is estimated for Hadley. And I look at the vaccination rate, which unfortunately, um, it's, it's pretty, it's not bad, it's, it's, it's decent and even good until we reach the 75 plus age cohort, only 54% of which in Hadley are fully vaccinated. Um, wow. Our board and I came, developed a, a policy during, bef preceding the last surge, which we'll say was late fall, early winter. So November into December, we closed again in December having been open for just a couple of months. And we closed because at that, we had 25 or more positive cases in Hadley and we were in the yellow. That was when the state, um, when that, that data uh, color coded communities. Mm -hmm. And um, so we could at a glance have kind of a, a, a notion of the intensity of outbreaks in our communities. And we made the decision that when we were in the yellow, which was when there would be 25 or more cases, we would, we would close except for essential services. Um, we are poised to make a decision again. We're not there yet. We're at 11.1 you know, um, positive cases in Hadley right now, according to that data. Uh, we'll need to make a decision if we want to abide by the policy we defined or if we want to change it. Uh, and I don't know, we have to really have a conversation about that. I really don't want to backtrack on access to the space and what we do. And it's personally rewarding to have people coming in and utilizing programs and using the rooms. I'm so happy when I happen to notice that every single room has someone using it. There's someone reading in here. There's someone using the fitness room. There's some. There, it's a, people are playing pool. That is great. Someone's just casually using the art studio. I mean, it's not unusual. But and and I very much do not want to retreat from that. So I'm I'm going to have to have conversations with Dr. Susan Mosler, who I really rely on for guidance with these decisions. I've also um, leaned on Anne, um, Anne McKenzie, our superintendent, who happens to be extremely good at, well, at her own policies, which are complicated and reach a diverse audience of parents and children. And um, she helped us, she helped me come up with the scheme for our, our last policy that I just mentioned. Uh, I'll probably talk to her again about ideas. We, for instance, we, I made a decision to really focus on Hadley data because for the mm -hmm. most part, we do have people from Amherst, but for the most part, we serve Hadley seniors. Yes. And I do think that it, it, it makes sense. It's defensible to be looking at Hadley numbers and have those be the things that dictate. Yes. Um, so those are the kinds of things that I'm thinking about. And I don't have, I haven't made a solid decision about continuing to uphold our, our, our current policy, shall we say, or developing a new one that is less cautious. Question, Haley. The decision, final decision, is with whom? I believe it's with us and our board. So you and the board will make a the decision. Staff yeah, will make uh, that decision. I, I would run it. I would announce it to the select board um, mm -hmm. and get um, the recommendation of um, the board of health as well. Mm -hmm. Good. 
I'm interested in your perception. I think Hadley is a unique community. Mm -hmm. As someone said to me after church Sunday, we are an agricultural community. And one of my questions is, Haley, are we an agricultural community? Yes. <laughs> Hadley is an agricultural <laughs> community. It absolutely is. I think anyone would have that, that impression driving around, particularly once you get off Route 9, and it's been so lovely to, dis to understand the depths of Hadley in, um, on either side of, of this you know, major road. Mm -hmm. It's been fun and rewarding to see the beauty and the houses and the, the residential communities and get to know that better. There are, I just learned this, that Hadley's landmass is about 40% agricultural. So that's really amazing. Eighty percent of the land mass yeah. is in I it's agriculture. The highest in the state of any county in the state. I didn't know that. So I'm that, sorry, that Jay. adds the highest of any county yeah. in the state. Thank you. Yes. Okay. And there are at least twenty farms in Hadley. I'm sure more. That was that number. I really even, shouldn't even say that because that's just looking. That's googling farms in Hadley and counting <laughs> them. And I don't think that really. I, and I think that there is a lot more nuance to that as well. But yeah, mm -hmm. there's, and you can, and the, you know, farm stands and all the anecdotal information that I get from participants here who talk about harvesting asparagus before school <laughs> when they were kids and, and um, drawing tobacco and really being involved in the agricultural cycle of this town. A lot of people have had those experiences and it shaped their lives and I hear about it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. To arrow in then on the senior role mm -hmm. in Hadley, I'm interested in whether you think this senior center has a unique mission because of the nature of our community, or are senior centers, you know, cookie cutter, or you kind of do what you do? Interesting question. Let me think about that for a sec. Okay, and also <laughs> while we're doing it, I'll remind folks that Haley is the director, but she is supported by Violet, who is the program coordinator. Yes. And by Lauren, the outreach worker, and by Jane, who spends all her time here, but we don't know what she does. <laughs> everything, I think, everything. is the answer. A little bit to of that. everything. Yeah. <laughs> A little bit of everything. And we have van drivers. We do. And about 30 active volunteers. Yes. And who probably put in close to, there's one. Uh -huh. There's one at the desk over there. There's one, our board member. <laughs> um, volunteers are here all the time making things go and spend about 400 hours a, a month uh, wow. supporting what we do. It would absolutely be impossible without them. So I really thank you, volunteers. I, I see you. I uh, honor you and thank you. Good. I'm not going to leave that question. I'm trying no, to get okay. time underneath but I, to think I, through. I want to just acknowledge that, you know, it's kind of a, you've probably heard, maybe you haven't, this is in, in Council on Aging Director Circle. Once you've seen one senior center, you've seen one senior center. That's the expression <laughs> because they all do tend to be very unique and reflect the values of their community, the flavor of their community, whether or not they're fortunate enough to have an amazing new building like this, nobody is. <laughs> or, uh, or if they're, you know, making do with something that is um, less accommodating, um, and many do, and many do so with a lot of grace and creativity. And I've worked in um, one such space in East Hampton. I, I do believe that there's a consistent mission among councils on aging and how they get how they support that mission and how they prioritize what they do in support of that mission will differ. But I do believe that all councils on aging are concerned with helping the older people in their community age in place and doing that um, by giving them a great place to spend time, giving them access to important services, referrals, information, um, and, and making the quality of life in general better. Senior center directors probably differ from person to person in terms of what kind of policy-based advocacy they're doing. You know, if they're doing, if they're promoting a specific perspective in the town, 
and saying, I want more affordable housing and I want to be involved with talking about how we do that. That could be one flavor. I'd like to be that flavor. I'm not there yet, but <laughs> I, I, I applaud it. Or being someone who um, is really in touch with state representatives or the state senator or um, other people who are influence, um, or who are influential in various issues that affect older adults. Uh, so I do think that various senior centers and their directors and staff differ as to their approach with, with that. But I think that we all have in common the desire to help people age in place to the, to the greatest degree possible and with the most comfort. This must not be new territory, the idea of aging in place, the idea of the senior center supporting that. It sounds like you know the senior center is a speck on the town of Hadley. So is there an infrastructure, is there a way to help us that other people have laid out or trodden before us? How am I doing with that question? Yeah, you know that's I'm perfect. That's a great segue for me to <laughs> say something about the age-friendly and dementia-friendly movements in Massachusetts and to announce that Hadley, um, with the approval of the select board and the town administrator, has applied for membership in the Massachusetts network of age and dementia-friendly communities. Age-friendly, and maybe you've heard this, maybe you haven't, is a movement that um, was originated not in the United States, um, somewhere in Europe, in 2006 by the World Health Organization, and the AARP took it on, you know, quite a few years ago in the U.S. in the U.S. and then. Uh, Councils on Aging and state-based chapters of the AARP have been promoting it and inviting participation very successfully. It, it, is, it is well known, um, and many communities in Massachusetts are age-friendly, or trying to be, have, mm -hmm. have joined the network and are aspiring to create the kinds of programs and work plans and strategic plans that can get them from one point to another in terms of supporting um, age-friendly practices and informing and, and, and encouraging people to see a lot of the decisions that any town might make through the age-friendly lens. This is really applicable to planning and development. Mm -hmm. This is really applicable to housing. Um, the age-friendly principles were strongly in place with this, the building, the creation and design of this building. I don't think that's what they called it, but that's what it is. Every physical plant decision about this space was made with the idea of access to um, seniors and people with this, these aren't the same thing but many seniors do develop disabilities particularly mobility disabilities and that um, was really front and center with design so that's an example of age-friendly principles working you know another example might be for the, the parks and recreation um, department to decide that they want benches at really at, at good intervals on the town common or what if there was a public bathroom available on some you know mm -hmm. in public space taking the needs of older adults into account more rigorously and um, fighting for the inclusion of certain kinds of features um, with the idea that it helps things it, it makes things better for everyone it's not just older people who benefit mm -hmm. but thinking about their needs in particular makes sense. So that's, you know, what we want to be doing here. So you see, am I hearing you correctly, that you see the Senior Center as an advocate across the town boards, committees? I, yeah, I, gosh, I hesitate to say that. That sounds so overreaching and um, giving myself a very big assignment, not just me, but anyone who supports what we're doing. Linda LaDuke is on the age-friendly working group as a member, mm -hmm. um, so she is representing, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and I am working to include a greater, you know, a larger group of people from our community to be part of this conversation. Um, and mm -hmm. you'll, see, you'll hear a lot more from us about all this. This is in its infancy. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, I do, I do see uh, the senior center and the allies of the senior center and community members doing direct advocacy ac across departments to make sure that age-friendly principles are followed. Got it. That's great. Perhaps we could ask Linda if she has any input on the whole age-friendly thing. I, I don't want to put you on the spot <laughs> if you don't, 
But if you do, this is a moment. One of the um, things that astounded me when I joined the council was to hear that one third of happy residents are seniors. Wow, a That's third. That's a very large number. It is. And so to serve the Hadley community is a big job that Hadley's taking on. Yes, and, and she has a full-time job just keeping this place running, I think. Exactly. Yeah. Well, part of this, I mean, like you said, if, if it's good for seniors, it's generally good for everybody. It makes life easier and more enjoyable for everyone in the community. Mm -hmm. so. But it's also nice to be able to think about a town where people can age in place, where they don't have to be housed somewhere. That's lovely, yes. And I would note, I happen to have had, Joan and I actually have both had the experiences of, of trying to live in Hadley and finding that. Joan, you want to share your experience with that? Well, when I first came here 10 years ago, I started looking. And then I lived in my daughter's basement for three years <laughs> so that I would have the money to put down on something and just never was successful in my price range. And also, I didn't want a huge house anymore, but and maybe one level, <laughs> that would even be better. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, even though I can still do stairs now, but I don't, you know, I would like to find a permanent location. Um, and one of my ideas is I travel around Hadley enjoying the farms and everything, and, and I really commend the Kestrel Trust that has saved the farmland, mm -hmm. because I lived in a community where the farmland is just about gone because it's just house after house and you could almost reach, put your arms out and hit the sides of two different houses. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wondered if we could, maybe in some farms, if they could give, say, 300 feet back from the road and that would be a lot for a house. Mm -hmm. And so we could maybe have what they call starter homes or maybe the ending homes when we want to downsize. Both, both things could be in the one type of house, actually. Um, and it wouldn't take up the farmland that much. It would still be there. I think the other thing we've heard, and you mentioned starter homes, reminds me, John, of people saying, my children can't live here no. in this right. town. Right, and all my repair people that were coming from Hadley, <coughs> Um, so many of them said they had young people that wanted to come back here to work and they, they're commuting from other communities in the area because they couldn't afford to find a place or they couldn't afford a place here. In Hadley. Yeah. yeah. That's got I nothing. I won't name names. I could even name one of the companies up here on Route 9. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's a great example of how an age-friendly development would suit multiple generations. Yes. To, to have the kinds of homes that are appropriate for first-time buyers yes. and last-time buyers. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, the, the, another discussion, it doesn't seem like there's a great deal of rental. It does property, seem like there I is think a it's low. a huge issue in this town. Mm -hmm. And well, I'm not speaking to either side of it. Excuse a me. lot of those small starter homes are rental property that are owned by developers who have lots of homes that they are renting to students. And they get and more rent than they can the from multiple towns. Town has said, now yeah, maybe this has changed, but that you cannot limit how many unmarried people live. Amherst has made a different decision, but Hadley said we cannot restrict the numbers. So some of those starter homes that you could have afforded were quickly purchased by uh, landlords yeah. that they could rent them out to six, eight, ten students. So, and I don't, and that's one of the things that I sometimes wonder, do those students, are they consider, are they actually uh, happy residents? Because if you look at the town listing, there will be a house, I know that there are six, eight, ten students there, but there are only a couple listed at that residence in the state listing. But they're still probably having their home town as being where they live. So while there may be starter homes or smaller homes that would be appropriate for older seniors, but they have been used for other purposes. Am I hearing you? Right. Okay. That they're rental property. Yeah, right. <clears throat> so, and the other thing is we already have, there's so many um, 
lots that were separated out on the street. I mean, if you go down and see a lot of our areas, the first lot, which does have a minimum restriction, which is fairly big, it's a third of an acre, I believe. Wow. Um, that sells for, you probably have a better idea what that price is, $175,000 <coughs> for the land. Um, so 20 years ago, we bought ours for $65,000. That behind that is farmland. So they took out that part, the back part can stay under the cheaper land because you can't build on it for a variety of reasons. But that front part is houses, but they have, it's not like close together so you can have several small units um, and therefore cheaper price. You have a bigger, like East, East Commons Drive. Have you mentioned earlier that an interest of yours that's developing is housing? And I do think it's a real serious issue. One of the things I've noticed, there are more students looking for housing in Hadley, and they're finding it in seniors' homes where people on limited income are renting out their rooms and their basements and trying to make ends meet. And that is just in my neighborhood, which is very residential, there are now four or five homes where students are living. Um, a couple of them group homes, but several in people's houses just as housemates. Mm -hmm. Well, to me, that sounds like a reasonable solution. Mm -hmm. It might not be really easy from the owner's perspective, and there's give and take, and there is compromise, but that, that suits two needs. Mm -hmm. really well I, I and I have been interested in facilitating networking between homeowners who want to rent out a room and and people who need a room because I do think that that is one model for keeping something financially viable and renting out rooms in your home as a senior brings with it some concerns yes you know there are well seniors are not all in the same boat in terms of being able to take care of somebody living in their home. Absolutely. You know, so. yeah. Right. I mean, there are vulnerabilities that come to mind with that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how one would ever regulate or uh, find the parameters that work for everyone. Well, I think every action has consequences, right, Linda? So you have something that may be a solution but it also may create a problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think Hadley is going to be in the uh, depths of this kind of discussion over the next several years, probably, even. But you are talking, you and Linda are talking about a structure that may help approach that whole kettle of fish. I don't have any solution. <laughs> well, I'm thinking about the age-friendly movement that oh, you talked about. Encompass that. It's a big, big thing, though. That right. You take it on. <laughs> and we can't solve the problem of housing in Hadley. Mm -hmm. I, I don't mm -hmm. have the illusion that that is within the purview of mm -hmm. our work. But I do think that housing is one of the more acute problems that we are surfacing, and that the more we know about the actual facts about what's happening in, in Hadley and what the options are and what housing is available outside of Hadley. I'm, I'm always, and so is Lauren Hannigan, our outreach worker. We're trying to increase our, say, let's call it housing literacy all of the time in terms of what's available elsewhere. How does the housing authority work? How does someone get on that waiting list? How long is it? What are vouchers? There's maybe three at least kinds of vouchers. What, what defines them? Um, it's, it's a big topic, um, and there's, you know, what, what leads to eviction? What, Lauren is, is helping someone right now who's in an eviction process. What are the legal resources for low-income people to have recourse? Mm -hmm. What relief did, co did, did funding through, uh, you know, COVID money, how did that relieve people? And, um, you know, the eviction moratorium that everyone's heard of, that's come to an end, I think, in, in Massachusetts. There, there is an endless amount of information to understand about housing and the challenges of housing in this community and in Hampshire County. And 
another thing we can always do is learn more about what other affordable or low income options exist outside of this town. I think I probably took us off on a very broad road called <laughs> housing. Right, I know, it's a big topic. It's a big topic, mm-hmm. and I apologize if I've taken us off there, but I am thinking about it's a huge issue in your whole aging in place, age friendly. Mm-hmm. Are there other large issues around sure. that uh, we don't need to solve, right. but we might at least address as problems? Transportation. Okay. Transportation is, is, is difficult for people who are at that juncture where they can no longer drive. Most Mm-hmm. Mo- most, almost, not all, but most people that I encounter who are older who live in this town drive, and they get here in their car. We have a lot of parking. We do have a van system, so this is a good opportunity for, to, for me to mention that our van system runs Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from between 9 and noon. It is on a repeating loop um, on the sort of Route 9 corridor, but people who need medical appointment transportation to out of town or off route destinations can get that help we have a a group of volunteers drivers who will help people we need a lot of advance notice but I want to put it out there because we do meet several needs in that regard and I think we're doing a good job and I feel like the combination of our van of our regular circular route kind of non-deviating and the individualized service that we can provide in a, the, using our car that we own um, mm-hmm. to people to have out-of-town appointments is genuinely helpful. Nonetheless, we, that, so that, that's our way of trying to solve uh, transportation co- issues mm-hmm. for people. But so, it's not enough. Yeah, and I, um, I don't, you know, the PVTA is difficult <clears throat> to use. It's difficult to read and understand the schedule the, you might be standing on a corner for a window of 20 minutes in bad weather waiting for your ride. Um, paratra- they have a paratransit system. If you are in, in a wheelchair or need assistance in using a lift to get into a van, uh, and that is a dial-a-ride system, but that has its own set of complications. Mm-hmm. Using public transportation is tricky. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I've also met people who are right on the cusp. I know people that come here now who have just had to give up a car or are on the verge of needing to give up a car. What happens when I see someone drive over our flower bed leaving <laughs> leaving the parking lot yes. and realize, wow, I really wish he wasn't driving. Yeah. But it's mm-hmm. not my job to take his keys away. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, how do we tactfully, and, and, and as, as a community, as a family member, as a friend, mm-hmm. uh, approach this issue um, you know the issue being multiple in terms of just reaching that point at which you shouldn't drive anymore because you're not doing a good job with it and you can't see too well and the fact that the public transportation options aren't going to meet your needs and you're going to have to learn to adapt all right i'm tired already (laughs) so transportation (laughs) that's another one transportation housing transportation (laughs) social inclusion what I'm doing right now is naming the focus group, the focus areas of the age-friendly movement, by the way. Good. Thank you. So social inclusion would be, um, and, and equity would be having awareness of the diversity of people in this community and going the extra mile to make all people feel welcome. It feels sometimes like it's easy to do that, but the more I think about it and the more experiences I have here, the more I realize that we have things to learn and that... I personally can do better at reaching out and going the extra mile for someone who might have struggled to access what I'm trying to give. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for example, we need to uh, have a tra- we need a translation service to be at our fingertips. We need to be able to um, to, to have an interpreter be ready when we need that person. I'm selecting a service right now, but it's taken me a while to get to the point where I realized that. Um, and social inclusion can can be a problem in another way. There are people in, in this town who um, don't feel like they can go out of their home. Mm-hmm. They don't feel like they can come to the senior center, you know, um, because they're isolated. And they may not feel like they belong or that they can make it here for a variety of reasons. Mm-hmm. So. You know, one of the things that you've been doing is reaching out to those folks, trying to find them. I can think of one one person in our neighborhood who lost his spouse of 65 plus years and just did not know what to do. Mm-hmm. And um, 
neighbors, quite a few neighbors, encouraged him to come here. And he now feels included. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Thank and you. he's, I think, someone you know, who, ha he had a recent tour here. Yes. And I haven't seen him since, and I hope he comes back. But um, yeah, I've seen him a couple times. So. Mm -hmm. right. Encouragement. That's just great. Encouragement, yeah. right. Yes, yeah, so you can feel... There. Sure, Jeff. I'd like to say my wife needs me home. During the COVID situation about a year ago, Harry and her team helped all of us with getting food with the police department. Mm -hmm. I don't look 75, but I am. <laughs> <laughs> I sometimes feel it. But Harry and her team, for probably at least three, four months, was so helpful because we were all afraid to go to the supermarket, yes. and shop. And I know I spoke to him many times, I thanked him at least twice <laughs> for the extraordinary discipline, absolutely thorough work. And the way Haley is talking, as articulate and as kind as she is here, she's twice as kind as she is in action. Because <laughs> I spoke with her many times when I first met her about a month ago as I came. I said, Well, you're Haley, I just want to thank you so much. And I really mean that from the bottom of my heart. So, mm -hmm. wow. Thank Welcome, you, Jeff. Jeff. Thank, Thank you. you for mentioning that. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thanks. And I, I want to just make sure that on the tail of that, I mentioned that it was the fire department. We organized grocery shopping, got lists, put them together, submitted them to the fire department, and the fire department staff, sometimes the chief himself, and their volunteers did the shopping and the deliveries, and that was Herculean, and I will forever be grateful. That's a beautiful example mm -hmm. of an age-friendly interdepartmental collaboration. And there are more of those, are there not? There are. Why there don't sure you are. I'll tell you about those. a couple others. Um, <laughs> our tax collectors here every Wednesday, that's Sue Glowatsky, fantastic human, also happens to be a member of the Friends of the Hadley Council on Aging. She's here um, from, uh, oh gosh, I'm going to get the time wrong. Is it 2 to 3 on Wednesdays? I was going to say 2 o'clock. I think it's 2 to 3 on Wednesdays. Um, and she sets up um, with her laptop in the dining room, and she is available for walk-in assistance. You can come in with a question. You could pay a bill. Uh, it, she, she will just be available to you, and she's very knowledgeable and thorough and helpful. So that's just one modest but incredibly helpful and good-hearted example of you know another interdepartmental collaboration the triad program which is a volunteer volunteer based program and almost I'd say probably every senior center that I'm aware of has such a program and it's a collaborative effort of the Council on Aging the police department the fire department and the sheriff's department and the district attorney's office get together and have meetings and they administer they they plan events we're having a shredding event at mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Home Depot in October that's triad sponsored and organized. We help people get reflective numbers at the bottom of, you know, at right at their driveway mm -hmm. at street level so that emergency um, personnel in an emergency can readily identify that house number and not be searching for it and save seconds that mean a lot. They help affix um, lock uh, boxes with um, extra keys to people's homes that have a, um, a combination known to the police department so that if they have to do a wellness check they're not going to beat down your door they can take the key from that box and open that door and check on you without causing thousands of dollars of damage and mm -hmm. that's fantastic and I will just tell you that that was you that very someone had a lock box who we did who, who had a wellness check just two weeks ago and I was so glad she did because I was very afraid that the police would have no choice but to beat down her Break door. Mm -hmm. And then what would happen? Um, and and the salt buckets too? And they, the and they, and they yes, yeah, sand, they, they deliver um, sand buckets at, in winter and they, um, those are the main programs that they do but they are open to other things. It's a, it's a pretty creative group with a lot of, uh, you know, potential to do more. And I'm reminded I ran into two policemen as I was leaving yes. the building. Yes, yes, yes. I was teasing office, yeah. them about parking there, and mm -hmm. so we had a nice little chat. But mm -hmm. what were they here for? They were here to deliver lunches. So oh. the police department, you know, people, various uh, uh, police officers will come on Wednesdays and grab the lunches that are being delivered. We we have a lot of food programs, and one of them is um, delivered portable lunches. And so the, the police and the fire department has helped with this, and um, 
and, and a growing group of volunteers does it, but still very faithfully on Wednesdays, police come and grab some lunches and deliver them to people's homes. And we are grateful. And I think it helps them too have just a little more insight, you know, about this community, about older yes. adults. The police also, I want you to know, have a program called the Silver Alert Program. You can, and they are aware and, um, of people with Alzheimer's who are at risk of wandering. And so they have, you know, a, a database of individuals in this town who might live alone and might have severe memory loss and um, are in a higher risk category and they have awareness of them. Coffee City. with the cops too. And coffee with a the cop. They come once Absolutely. a month and talk very engagingly with the community mm -hmm. about the work they're doing, about different kinds of trends, whether or not there are a lot of car break-ins happening that month. <laughs> um, they take questions, they show their equipment, they're very transparent, they've you know, graciously answered questions about um, the kind of PR problems that the police in this country have yeah. had and their perspective on that. Uh, so they are you know, pretty open and accessible and seem to enjoy talking to people. Mm -hmm. I've been very pleased, I think, in terms of our experiences in life. Mm -hmm. uh, the Hadley police are just superb. Can I bring up a, a totally different thing? Please. Really? The interaction from <laughs> post-pandemic, if we ever get there. Um, I used to teach in middle school, and we had an assisted living next door to us. Yes. And this one day, this, this woman walked in, and she sat down at the back of one of the classrooms. This is in prior to when the schools were all locked up. You could mm -hmm. pretty much walk in. And so after the, the teacher, when she had a break, she went back and, can I help you? And she said, oh, I got lost. I went for a walk. <laughs> and I knew when I saw the school, this was a safe place. <laughs> so she had come in for help. But then we were, as teachers, we were spinning off that. Here we have this facility, 100 feet at the most, away from the school. And what if we ask some of the seniors if they would like to come over and mentor our elementary kids who are having trouble with reading, to meet with them maybe in the library and just one-on-one -on -one have the kids read to you? Love it. And I, yes, and I thought, yeah, and here we have Hadley Elementary just up the street, and I just would love to see a program like that maybe occur because it that builds trust in the young people looking at us older people mm -hmm. and realizing mm -hmm. we're human and we have stories too. And yes, know, it, it does. It builds a, a tighter relationship, I think, mm -hmm. between the generations. I would love to support and build intergenerational programming here. And thank you for sharing that idea. I like it a lot. I, I will admit I haven't really investigated the logistics of building, of figuring something out that would really work from all points of view and with the various. I'm sure they have to check on criminal history and all yeah, there, there's, a, a, there's a lot involved. I yeah. mean, un, un, you know, the distance between having that great idea and making it real is, mm -hmm. is pretty it's big. Pretty but but I really like it. But we're, what we're talking about these I last few minutes, so. I think, is that whole. Oh, the community social safety net yes. yeah, that we can build to together. And I think Hadley is a small enough community and a caring enough community yeah. that that's possible here. And you were the other thing we've talked about is the directions for the age friendly. So we talked about the need to talk about housing, the need for transportation, the need for social inclusion. I don't want to miss if there's any other major issues that that group is dealing with before we leave it. All right, let's see. What else can I remember? Um, <laughs> Linda Helper. Yeah. She's civic. old. <laughs> um, there, are, there are, in the age-friendly paradigm, there are eight focus areas. Oh, okay. um, and I, I, it might, some of the other ones that I'll throw out are... Um, Outdoor space and buildings, so our green space, uh, recreational space, buildings, this, this is a great example of that. Um, how accessible is Town Hall? Well, it's got kind of a scary elevator that I don't think a lot of people want to have to experience. I happen to know Jane Nevinsmith doesn't ever want to go upstairs there. Um, I'm thinking about the Hooker School and that little and I, and I, elevator I, I, when yes. we were there. Right. Before you, I guess. I heard that, the horror story of that. and. Um, other areas to think about in terms of increasing our or, or strengthening our age-friendly muscle would be um, civic participation and employment opportunities. Um, 
public for health seniors, for, for seniors, seniors for okay. seniors, uh, public health in general, and technology and communications. And I think we witnessed a real disaster when the uh, the vaccine was rolled out in February when so many seniors who did not either have computers or the internet could mm-hmm. not register for a shot. Yep. Mm-hmm. And there wasn't for, there was a bit of time before there was any other way to do it. Mm-hmm. Eventually they, in, in, they uh, introduced that 211 phone number, which was still difficult for people to use. Um, we utilized it and we did advise people to utilize it. But nonetheless, lack of access to and comfort with or desire to use technology is a growing barrier and we're trying here to meet needs by giving one-on-one tutorials Um, we do have I will mention that we have a set of tablets here that anyone is welcome to use just for fun and if you want to learn about it and get some assistance from a staff member please let us know and we'd be happy to arrange it Um, it's the kind of thing you should probably call ahead and ask about. It's a little hard to just drop everything and do it, but we would be glad to make a specific time to to help with something like that and to introduce anyone who would like to learn more about um, touchscreen technology and one way the town could improve <laughs> access to technology would be to have um, low-cost internet access and you know and to get out from under spectrum being you know the mm-hmm. monopoly. Um, that dictates the pricing. That is not an affordable service for a lot of people. And Mm -hmm. I know the town is in talks about, and John, maybe you know the answer to this. I feel like you and Drew might be involved in a town committee to discuss the town taking some control over um, internet access, municipal internet for Hadley. Yes, I have heard something about that. Yeah. So I think that's in the works, and that, that would be something that, I would look into more. That, that that would be a good example of, I think, possibly low-hanging fruit, age-friendly improvements that this town could, could benefit from. Um, Let's talk about um, how you're uh, going to communicate with the town in terms of the age-friendly paradigm. Uh, do you have a um, something... <laughs> You know what the question is, just answer it. <laughs> <laughs> well, We do prep for this, believe yeah. it or not. <laughs> we... Our, our working group is working on a, a contact list to, um, to list names and contact information of allies in multiple sectors, you know, municipal, are in all these departments, um, uh, business, educational, faith communities, and so on. This is a group effort. I, I'm not going to personally be able to be the ambassador that is the be-all and end-all of this, and so I'm looking to other members of the community, members of our working group, my staff, to build, to start and maintain relationships and dialogue and have conversations and invite one-on-ones and even focus groups about about age-friendly principles, how they intersect with other municipal departments, what what are the age-specific observations you've had as a worker in Hadley that come to the come to the fore when you think about what could we do better to make being here easier for older people? You know, so for example, I could easily have that conversation with Sue Glowatsky, who's already thought about it and already offers something. Mm-hmm. Um, the police are, I think, are already uh, actively engaged in that, yes. um, and I think that. Probably, I think the planning department will be very uh, relevant in 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 this. Mm-hmm. And um, in fact, Bill Dwyer, who's the secretary of the planning department, got in touch with me when he was aware that the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission ha- had an opportunity that we are using to to have a senior planner be involved in our in our in our um, application process and planning for age friendly. So we are in that program now, um, and he. I did know about it, but he brought it to my attention. He emailed me, and I think it's great that it was on his radar. Um, so I would love to have conversations with various chairs, department heads, um, and then other other you know leaders in in other um, and non leaders. Don't need to be a leader to talk to me about this. Um, you know, you people in all leader. sectors. Right? You can be an age friendly leader, uh, but it, there we have to have a lot of conversations and a lot of focus groups, and I'm kind of scared of the work, but also kind of excited by it. Give me a dream list without scaring Hadley (laughs) taxpayers to death. 
What's your dream list around the Council on Aging, around the Senior Center? <coughs> Not that these will necessarily come yeah. to fruition, but we all have yeah. a dream list, right? I'd like additional staff members. Additional staff members? Yeah. Yeah. We could use, <laughs> and it, we could use, um, well, an office manager or high-level administrative assistant to do a lot of the administrative tasks. I will. I do think that admi administrative support in the town of Hadley for all departments is not high. Um, there, everyone does a lot. I think my colleagues are hardworking, and every single one of them prints their own labels, mails their, own, you know, opens their own mail, and does high-level thinking about the, the function of their department. So, yes. a lot is being done by few, um, and we're no exception. We could use some support. I would, I would love to see our van program um, be more robust and maybe be five days a week, although we would need the need for that to be more readily apparent. Right now, um, the demand isn't as high as I would have expected, but I don't know if that's our failure in not getting the word out. Um, or the pandemic. <laughs> Yeah, the right. Pandemic. There are there's so many yep. influencing elements with mm -hmm. with all of these things. Haley, if you had fewer administrative tasks, like you know lifting boxes to the shredder, <laughs> <laughs> would would you spend more time on grant writing and um, accessing other funds besides town and friends? Oh, that's interesting. Good question. No, <laughs> <laughs> not if I could help it. But let me say this about that. There are those of us around who have written grants. Mm. And you talk about a volunteer um, effort. I think that's a role that you might right. search. And research and finding out what's available. Mm -hmm. I, uh -oh. I wish I had more time to read. That's on my wish list. And that, I, yeah. I wish I had more time to just dig, to just be a little more free form in finding things out, researching, reading, staying abreast of the field. And uh, being having a little more mental latitude as opposed to feeling very, you know, quite constrained by tasks. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that we've been at this an hour. We have. <laughs> <laughs> it went by so fast. It went by so fast. I want to make sure we don't um, miss anything that you think is important for the town to know. Yes, thank you. Do that, and then we can probably, John, call it a day, but then if we want to continue our discussion, for those of you who were gracious enough to join us, we can do that. Does that All work right. for everybody? <laughs> I want to mention um, that there will be a mobile vaccine clinic here in the parking lot between this building and the library next Tuesday, September 14th, from 10 to 1. It is available on a walk-in basis. You do not need to pre-register, although you can on the NorthamptonMA.gov website. Um, their, their COVID vaccine webpage has a pre-registration option. Um, it's not yet live for this site, but it will be. Nonetheless, it's not necessary. This is free. Insurance is not required. You can get your first, second, or third, and I'll explain that, Pfizer shot, or right. the one and done Johnson and Johnson shot. They are not offering Moderna. If that's what you want or feel that you need, you can get on a list and they will try to figure out how to help you with that. Um, third shots will be available for people who are immune compromised. The criteria for being immune compromised is on the, Mass is on the Northampton website, or you can call us and I can rattle off all the things. Um, but it's, it, and they're not calling it a booster shot, they're calling it a third shot in the series for immune compromised people. They will give you that if, you, if that is what you need, if you're there in the series, it, it needs to be at least 28 days out from your last, your second shot. Uh, so all ages, you don't have to be from Hadley. I really hope that this puts a dent in our um, not terrific stats for vaccination. When again? Just repeat. It, sept next Tuesday, September fourteenth, ten a.m. to one p.m. It'll be in. They're having a mobile. They're going to. They're going to bring a trailer and a tent, um, and they'll be in that parking lot 